Hello, party people, and welcome to Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, regular viewers and eagle-eyed viewers will remember that I shot a video here for Office Hours about one year ago this month. Uh, Eve and I were here for to visit friends of ours in Salem uh, for Halloween season, and they our friends ended up scheduling their wedding for uh, this uh, this month here. So we're in town for their wedding, and I'm thinking we're going to probably make it like a regular uh annual occurrence it has this really nice spooky fall vibe to it you know where the, it's a lot of overcast skies it rains a lot something that we don't get a lot out in vegas uh the leaves are changing it's just a really nice place to be around september october especially they go all out with uh, uh all kinds of tourist activities too as well you, you'll, you'll probably notice too at some point in this because i usually use this to show the questions I put a little sticker on the back of here that says car. The reason behind that was because I have to remember to start remote start our Defender uh, whenever we're in Vegas. When I go to pay the bill at a restaurant, I get a credit card out, and I, I kept forgetting to start the car so that the air conditioning would kick on if we were parked somewhere uh, out in the heat. So I ended up putting that sticker back on there. So let's go tackle your top voted questions from PollGab. The number one question is from Dumped On DBA, who says, how would you recommend storing data like zip codes uh, that might have spaces in them, like in Canada or the UK? We're having an issue when we want to search for a customer by zip code and the input may or may not have a space. The answer on that's really simple. You strip the spaces out when you store the data. One way to do that would be with a trigger. Another way to do that would be uh, with having the application do it. All things considered, I'd rather have the application do it. And then when the application makes searches, they also have a duty to strip out the space as well. That way you just can ignore the spaces altogether. It makes it really simple. The, it gets a little bit trickier when you have data with leading zeros. You got to make sure to not store them as numeric, otherwise you're going to get the leading zero stripped out. I've even found that some applications will just assume that the data is numeric in nature if you put in a search string that's all numbers. Um, and you got to make sure that the application understands it needs to include those leading zeros. Uh, next up, does time really exist, asks, Hi Brent, should I use Cassandra or SQL Server for storing 500 million records daily? Okay, hold up. It's not that 500 million records daily is unreasonable by any means, but I'm going to step back and say you probably don't even want it in a relational database. Ask yourself how you're going to be querying that data, and if the biggest use is trending, for example, you probably want something like a time series database or even dumping them into files, but step way back and start asking what it is that you're going to do with that data. When you query it, if you're not joining it to another table, it probably doesn't belong in a relational database. Stick it in a, a, a platform that's more designed for that kind of data. Especially when you're, you're talking about half a billion rows a day, uh, I just happened to see a really good video from Tinder, the dating uh, site, where they talked about how they store a billion rows a day in Elasticsearch. Uh, and it's even more interesting, but start by just asking what it is that you're gonna do with the data. Next up, Froz asks, what can you see, say about GMSA? This is an easy answer, nothing. I don't do any security work. It's actually prohibited in my contract. I can't stand security work. It's boring as hell to me, uh, but best of luck on your journey there. Next up, Otter asks, what was your opinion of Otter Tune for Postgres? Why do you think it failed when SQL Constant Care succeeded? Okay, first off, SQL Constant Care is a totally different market, a totally different product. It's targeted at something totally different. It's tar targeted at SQL Server people rather than Postgres. Um, but the reason Otter, there were two things that I had to say about Otter Tune. One is that the reason that they failed wasn't necessarily technical. It had to do with a failed acquisition. Uh, and I don't know the internal details. I just know from following Andy Pavlo and hearing him rant about some of that stuff. So it wasn't necessarily a technical problem. 
Um, the other thing I'd say about Otter Tune was that Richie and I actually tried it on Amazon Aurora, uh, and it did not work well at all. I was really, for both of us, were really frustrated that it seemed like it was making random guesses at things. Uh, and I even escalated it to the Otter Tune folks who came back and agreed, and they said, "Yeah, we're not doing a very good job of onboarding, uh, and we need to make it more clear that the product is going to do experiments on your database for a while." Uh, to see how things respond. And I'm like, yeah, but it keeps flipping the same number back and forth to two different values. That's not an experiment. It, yeah, I, I wasn't really that impressed with it technically. Now, it was early on. I mean, it was a, an early version product. So granted, everything's got growing pains and it takes a while to succeed, but that was that's my first gut hunch is that it didn't quite have product market fit just yet. And then the acquisition uh, didn't work out. Next up, Conzio asks, why does SQL Server sometimes want an index that just flips orders of columns? Um, first off, you want to know, I, oh man, I, I could go into a 15 minute explanation right here and now. Go enroll in my Fundamentals of Index Tuning course. In my Fundamentals of Index Tuning course, I explain how SQL Server comes up with those index recommendations uh, and why column order from Microsoft is just a comma delimited list of columns to consider indexing. They're not in the right order, and I prove why in that class. That's my Fundamentals of Index Tuning class. Next up, Tarzan Boy says, what are your thoughts for the res about the reserved instance trap for Azure SQL VMs where your VM becomes antiquated, but you're stuck with it due to reserved instances? Reserved instances, the way that they work is that you pre-buy the amount of compute power that you need for either one year or three year intervals. The exact specifics, I, I don't know off the top of my head for Azure, because most of my work is done over on Amazon, but the same basic concept applies. The time when it makes sense to use uh, reserved instances is when you have dozens or hundreds of reserved instances that you want to buy. Think a large company or enterprise and buy pools of them. That way, if you don't need it for one specific purpose, odds are you've got another VM or groups of VMs internally that needs a similar amount of compute power you're really buying large amounts of compute power. Think of it as like going to Costco or Sam's Club if you need one roll of toilet paper. That's a bad purchasing decision because Sam's Club and Costco aren't really focused on selling you one roll of toilet paper economically at a time. You go to Sam's Club or Costco when you love Taco Bell and you're not going to give up that habit and you know that you need to buy large quantities of toilet paper. I like Taco Bell. Moving on, AZ says, archiving is, <laughs> archiving is needed for a 10 terabyte table with frequent updates, seeking expert advice on optimized strategies for performance, storage efficiency, and data consistency. Help with tools, technology, and a step-by-step -step approach. Sure, that's consulting. Anytime you find yourself asking for tools, technologies, and a step-by-step -step approach, you're probably not going to get useful stuff out of free Q&A sites. And that same thing holds true whether it's my PollGab office hours, stackoverflow.com, sqlservercentral.com. People just don't have enough time to hold your hand and walk you through all of that stuff if you're starting from scratch, which it sounds like you are. That's okay, that's what consultants are for, and I'm not saying that just to sell my own services, but there are lots of people who've done this kind of thing before. What you wanna do is contact SQL Server consultants and lay out and say, here's what I need. What would your service offering look like? Typically what they're gonna do is they're gonna start with a day or two of paid work uh, to do an analysis of your current environment, to figure out where it is that you're at and uh, how what the capabilities of the staffing are, what pain points the business is facing, and then they'll use that day or two's worth of paid labor to come up with a price quote for what it would look like to deliver everything that you're asking for here. Because what you're asking for here is an entire project, not just a, a quick 30 or 60 second answer on a webcast. Hope that's fair, because you're, you're obviously asking for a lot. The more targeted your question is, the better suited it is for getting free help. 
And using your example, I'll give you an example. You said archiving needed for a 10 terabyte table with frequent updates, and you're seeking uh, uh, strategies for performance. Tell me, for example, you have one specific delete query where you're trying to delete out of that 10 terabyte table. Here's the problem that you're facing. Here's what the table looks like, the table structure. Here's what the execution plan looks like for that delete. Help me make it go faster. And then people can look at it and give you a reasonable answer within, say, 30, 60, 90 seconds for free. Next up, Zoltan asks, what is your opinion of IDERA's SQL Defrag Manager for managing index fragmentation? Is it worth the money? First off, go search for Brent Ozar Fragmentation, and you'll find a bunch of videos out there from me from different conferences and whatnot talking about my guidance on fragmentation. After you watch one or two of those videos, you'll be really well equipped to answer that question. Spoiler alert, you shouldn't be spending money on that. Uh, next up, Chandwich asks, Hey Brent, in the last office hours, you mentioned that a skill that many DBAs lack is their ability to communicate effectively. Have you considered offering a task on this specific topic? If not, are there courses you can recommend? I, I don't want to offer classes on it because I don't believe that I'm really like an expert on that. And I think that there are so many experts since effective communication is really across all kinds of industries. It's also a relatively inexpensive class or course to get because it is so globally standardized, not globally, but like nationally standardized on how you communicate effectively. You can get really in, uh, inexpensive courses like nine, twenty dollars, you know, twenty dollars or thirty dollars, uh, and there are tons of them out there. Is there one specific one I would recommend? Not off the top of my head. Um, I'm always a huge fan of uh, a couple of like consulting-related books, but I don't think I have a recommendation I could give off the top of my head for communication. Um, next up, Future Blogger asks, Hi Brent, I'm looking at starting a blog on databases and SQL Server to document my day-to-day -day learning. Do you have any tips or advice for me? Yes. Google for Brent Ozar, how to start a technical blog. Brent Ozar, how to start a technical blog. And I've actually written like a five or ten page long blog post about that exact thing. Now, it's been more than a decade since I wrote it. The basics are still in place. First off, understand what you're writing it for, like what's your primary purpose for it. Uh, are you trying to make more money in the short term, in the long term, just to help others, just to document for your resume? Much more inf info like that. Search for Brent Ozar, How to Start a Technical Blog. And then we'll do one more. Hal asks, do you foresee a day in the near future where certain chat GPT requests for technical support will require a credit card? Hal, they already do. Welcome to like 2023. Uh, chat GPT maxes out at a certain number of free uh, questions per day. If you hit that limit, then you have to sign up for a paid plan it is completely worth it. I am a paying member of ChatGPT uh, plus Gemini and uh, Anthropics Claude. Brilliant products for the ten to thirty dollars a month that they cost. It's like getting a coworker uh, who is creative and inspirational that you can bounce questions off all the time. Totally worth it. I don't think I pay anything with a bigger bang for the buck than my chat GPT bill. It's just absolutely phenomenal. All right, so that's it here. You know, I, I don't think I even mentioned what's behind me. Uh, what's behind me is Salem's uh, cemetery, and there's all kinds of interesting witch tours around here. Uh, Salem, of course, is home of the witch trials, where people were falsely accused of being witches and warlocks and uh, hanged or pressed to death. It's all kinds of or interesting, morbid stuff. Um, and so people come through here all day long doing uh, cemetery tours. It's really kind of interesting. My phone just went off. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a really interesting place. The thing that I find odd is that it's kind of famous for f killing people who weren't really witches, but then this whole entire town is witchcraft stores and people come here wearing witch costumes. 
There's something about that that doesn't quite add up. I don't quite understand how this works. So were witches real or not? And if they are real, then why these people got hanged and pressed to death. Why would we celebrate that if they said they weren't really? I have a lot of questions, but it's a charming place to be. So I'm going to go walk around town. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.